Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on avoiding uh, errors in declaring other direct costs under Horizon 2020. I am Robbie Dalacqua, and I'm working for the Common Implementation Center at the Directorate General Research and Innovation at the European Commission, and I have the pleasure to welcome you to this new webinar. It is indeed the first time that we are organizing a webinar on this particular topic. And, uh, but you might be aware that we have been organizing for the past two years uh, regular bi-monthly webinars on avoiding errors in declaring personal costs under Horizon 2020. But this is the first time today uh, that we are doing one webinar on avoiding errors in other direct costs. So why did we decide uh, to organize such a webinar? Uh, mainly for two reasons. The first one being that last year uh, we have sent out a questionnaire to beneficiaries. This questionnaire was aiming uh, to test uh, the knowledge of beneficiary on the rules uh, on cost eligibility. And the analysis of the replies to this questionnaire have shown that uh, there was still room for improvement in the knowledge of the rules on cost eligibility, not only uh, on the personal cost category, but also on other cost category. And the second reason is that uh, ex post audits that are uh, going on on Horizon 2020 uh, show that if the personal cost category remain uh, the category where most of the errors are identified, there are also a non-negligible part of errors that are identified in other cost categories. So, how will uh, this uh, webinar be organized uh, today? After this uh, small introduction, there will be a presentation made by the two colleagues that are he here with me today, uh, who are Angela Alvarez from the audit unit in uh, the Directorate General Research and Innovation, and my other colleague, uh, David Mejuto, who is uh, working in the legal unit of the DG Research and uh, Innovation. This presentation will last about 40 minutes, and uh, during the presentation, my colleagues will explain you the rules uh, on the cost eligibility, but they will also give you some hints uh, in order to avoid the most common errors identified in the declaration of other direct costs. After the presentation, we will have a Q&A session. And uh, this Q&A session will last about 45 minutes, so we, you will have plenty of time to uh, ask your questions. Concerning these uh, questions, we will use today Slido to collect uh, your questions. So I invite you already now to go on slido.com and uh, to put the event code other direct costs all together with an S at the end, other direct costs. And then you, will, you can start uh, introducing your question. Please uh, also before to uh, put your question on Slido, have a look at uh, the other question that have been already introduced. And if you see that the same question or a very similar question is already there on Slido. Uh, please do not type again your question, but just vote for that particular question. And uh, during the Q&A session, we will go through the questions starting uh, by the most popular one, by the most voted one. And I think this is it for uh, this small introduction. So I will leave you the floor now to my colleagues, uh, Angela and David and I will see you later for the Q&A session. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. I'm David Mejuto. I come from the legal uh, unit, the legal department in the GRTD. As uh, Robbie explained, it, we're gonna have a, a short introduction. We will try to keep it short so we have as much time as possible for the questions and answers. Uh, first of all, because we presume that at this stage of Horizon 2020, you are familiar with at least the basics of how to declare uh, cost uh, according to the uh, eligibility conditions. 
Uh, so I hope that by now you have understood that we will not speak about personal costs. We have fantastic webinars about personal costs. They are recorded. Uh, even you have different versions with different people, so you can hear different voices explaining the same thing. So we are now concentrating today in the all the direct costs, which means basically everything that is not personal cost and everything that is not indirect cost. But it's also important for those of you that are not sure to be in the right room that we explain that today, or we recall that today we are speaking about Horizon 2020 and that every framework program has different rules. So here you can see a timeline of the last uh, framework programs and you see that Horizon 2020 has finished somehow in 2020. Uh, but as you probably know, because we are today connected, there are thousands still of grants that are ongoing for which you still have to declare costs. Auditors will still have to check later on. And these are the uh, eligibility conditions on which we will concentrate today. So we are not speaking about Horizon Europe. Incidentally, we may have a reference, but it's not uh, the purpose of today. There are also webinars on Horizon Europe to which you can attend. And we, of course, suggest you to attend. Even more precise, we are speaking about cost reimbursement because also in Horizon 2020 we have a uh, different type of grants where still massively are based on cost reimbursement, but we also have lump sum grants and we have, you probably know, the unit cost grants which are mostly the Maria Slodowska Curie actions. We are not speaking about those today either. We concentrate on cost reimbursement. So the first issue that we need to define and the first difference that we need to make to understand uh, what we are uh, treating today is uh, what is a direct cost. Uh, we are all familiar with a generic definition of direct cost, but eventually how to uh, qualify a cost is a matter of uh, managerial decision because it's an internal information for a company. There is no an universal definition of how, what is a, a direct cost that applies everywhere and there is normally no uh, legal provisions either uh, generic to say what is a direct cost. But for us it's crucial to make this difference because we have a flat rate for the indirect cost. So if ever we will be discussions so unclear elements about what can you charge on the direct cost, uh, we might be paying twice the same cost, once through the direct cost, and again by applying the flat rate to this direct cost. That's the reason why Horizon 2020 has its own definition about what we consider to be a direct cost and what can be treated as direct cost in uh, Horizon uh, 2020 grants. So and our definition is that direct costs are costs that are directly linked to the action implementation and that can be attributed to it directly. And obviously, they might not include indirect costs. So more in detail, direct costs are costs that have been caused in full by the action. Let's take the examples of consumables you, that you buy uh, directly to be used completely in the action. Or that can be also costs that have been uh, caused in full but by several actions or internal projects. So it's not necessary that all our, our actions or, or projects, they might be internal to work also. And the attribution to a single action, for instance, our grant, has been directly measured. It's not just simply that it could be measured, it's that you have directly measured what part of that shared cost has been used for the specific action. Meaning that it's not allocated via cost drivers or, or proxies or estimations. It must be directly measured. Some additional elements, mm, a bit more from the Audi perspective, is that uh, you must uh, be able to have uh, to provide persuasive evidence of the uh, direct link to the action. Uh, there might be very surprising costs if you decide that 12 bottles, both bottles of Mexican tequila are being used in the action. It might be possible, but you need to demonstrate with documents why, how, and what for this was used. You must also have this cost properly recorded in order to allow this direct measurement of the use. And of course, uh, if you have the visit of our auditors, you need to be able to ensure that those uh, costs properly recorded can be audited. Those uh, measurement systems that you use must also accurately quantify the cost to define precisely what are the direct costs that have been uh, incurred for the specific action. And again, we insist very much on this point, direct measurement does not mean fair apportionment. 
it might be very practical for you, it might be perfectly logic and acceptable that you uh, allocate simply the cost. Uh, we will speak later, for instance, about electricity. But for us, it's not enough. I insist. Why is it not enough? Because we have the flat rate for the indirect cost. So necessarily, we must be extremely precise about what is in the direct cost, so that this direct measurement, upon which we later on will pay also the flat rate for the indirect cost. So no proxies, no cost drivers, no allocation keys. If you have to use one of these elements, a proxy, a driver, an allocation key, to define what amount you are charging into the grant agreement, this is not direct cost. Then it's going to be covered by the flat rate. OK? So some examples. We were speaking about energy or power supply, the electricity. Can you charge it as a direct cost in, into a Horizon 2020 grant agreement? Theoretically, yes. And I say theoretically because the, the tricky issue is that you need to measure exactly what is the electricity consumption that they, you use it, for instance, for a machine that you were using to, into the project or a laboratory. And it's not enough to say, yes, of course, of course I have an ele electricity meter at the entrance of the building, and then I divide by the number of square meters of each laboratory, and then I know how much is the electricity. That's perfectly fine for your own accounts. There's nothing to say about that. That's your management system. But for us, this is no direct measurement because it's the whole electricity of the building has been allocated to the different laboratories, machines, or, or offices, and has not been directly measured. So the possibility exists, but in the case of electricity, I have seen very rare cases in which this can be done in practice. Administration. Can its administrative staff members also be charged as direct cost into the action? Well, again, it's possible. It's rather uh, unusual. But it's possible. You will need to have timesheets for them. And what is much more important and which hardly ever happens, it must be your usual cost accounting practice to charge the uh, administrative staff as direct cost into projects. You know that one of the basic premises of our grants is that we follow as much as possible the usual practices of beneficiaries. So it must be your usual practice on top. And another example to, to wrap up this, this part, a multi-purpose equipment, which is used for several activities or actions. Can I charge his depreciation uh, to a new action as a percentage of his capacity just based on my experience, which might be very knowledgeable about the use of the machine? No. You must measure it. That's the key element of the direct cost. You must measure it. Angela. Thanks, David. I'm Angela Alvarez, as uh, was in already introduced. And I work for the central audit service, the common audit service. And I will talk about a bit the difference about be, uh, between contracts and subcontracts. It's a question we get often because the, the words sound similar, but they're actually quite different. So when we revert to contracts, we, we're talking about uh, those contracts that you sign to buy, to purchase goods, works, or services. Uh, and when you do these contracts, you have to ensure you follow base value for money and avoid conflict of interests. These are works, goods, or services that you need for the action, but actually do not entail someone else doing the action work for you. For example, we have CFS, our cer or the Certificate of Financial Statements, which is necessary for the action, but that doesn't mean you have to do it. You, have, you, you need an external provider that has the experience and the, and the qualifications to do it for, it for you. Or when you buy consumables to be used in the action, those are also uh, goods that you, work, that you buy through contracts or one of purchases. On the contrary, subcontracts are costs, are contracts that you enter to, for, uh, to engage a third party, a, a legal entity, to do an, act, uh, an activity of the action for you. Those uh, ta action tasks are defined in Annex 1. It's, uh, if it says that you're going to do an action uh, or you're going to carry a task for the action, then, uh, but you have someone else do it for you, that's what is, we consider subcontracting. It has to be clearly identified in Annex 1 that you're going to be do this, doing this. And if it's not, be careful. Uh, you could always ask the Commission to accept them uh, at a, la a later stage or during the, the um, execution of the action. But it's always better to have it identified at the beginning. Again, as with the contracts, you have to ensure you contract, you contract them following the principles of base value for money and avoid conflict of interest. Remember as well that a subcontract is not allowed between beneficiaries. If you need a, to contract a, from affiliates, it's also not usually allowed, but there are exceptions. 
let's have a look at better at the difference between the two. So contracts of, uh, contracts of purchase goods, works and services are ruled by Article 10 of the Grant Agreement. Again, these do not cover implementation of action tasks, but are necessary for the action. They don't need to be indicated in Annex 1, which is, is better for you because it allows you to, to more flexibility. And they have to, report it, to be reported under other direct costs, which is the subject of this webinar. On the other hand, subcontracts really concern implementation of action tasks. They need to be clearly budgeted and identified in Annex 1. And they have to be declared as a separate cost category under subcontracting costs. Uh, what is the best practice here? We are, I'll advise you to always demonstrate base value for money for both types of costs, subcontracting and purchase of goods, work, goods works and services. Uh, so what does this mean? So there has to be some kind of tendering, some market comparison at some point, depending on the value. You might not need to do a full tender for more value purchases, but you still need to ask the market what is the offer and what is the most competitive price for the quality you're looking for. You can ask for a single quote, as for a few offers, make a market survey, or, or if it's worth it, launch a, a public tender. If you already know the supplier at the time you sign the action, it is not enough to say that uh, it's accepted as an eligible cost. You still have to demonstrate that you selected that supplier following the principle of base value for money. And um, when it comes to what kind of market surveys you need to do, or how to compare the market and ask the market about the, the offers, you can follow your own practices, but you have to be careful to always ensure that the best value for money is respected. Remember that you can, your usual accounting practices or uh, procurement practices are okay, as long as they are used properly. For example, you might have uh, accounting practices that, are, that work for you, but are not acceptable according to the uh, rules of the grant agreement. As an auditor, what do I advise you? As I mentioned before, if my, if my subcontractor is already mentioned in Annex 1, is it already eligible? No, it's not. You have to still demonstrate that you have observed base value for money. How do you do this? Make sure you keep all the documents to support that you check the market and that indeed they were the best offers in terms of quality and price. What happens if my subcontractor is a friend? Well, in principle, there is not a real problem as long as you have observed the non-conflict of interest uh, criteria. What does it mean? You take enough distance from the procedure to ensure that he was the best offer, the best, uh, he was offering the best uh, quality and the best price. Make sure you take every measure to avoid any conflict of interest, which is defined as any family or emotional ties. Uh, you've been using the same provider for the last 20 years with a written framework contract, that's very well. And uh, you have a framework contract plate that's, that's very useful and valid. But is this been in place for 20 years, they might have been changed in the market, so it might be good to check the market again to see if it's the best price and the best quality you're obtaining. When it comes to conflict of interest, uh, you have to ensure you observe the Article 35 of the, of the Grant Agreement. That means you have to take enough measures to prevent any situation where your uh, impartial objective implementation of the action is compromised. This involves economic interest, political or national affinity, family or emotional ties, or any other shared interest. And if you notify, if you notice one of these situations, maybe it was unintended, but it just happened through the uh, action limitation, you have to notify the contracting authority uh, and take all the actions necessary to rectify the situation. If you don't, there might be consequences, like the action could be terminated or uh, the grant could be reduced. What is the best practice here? Well, from the beginning, from the start of your action and for any other activities you, can, you have, ensure you demonstrate base value for money, take measures to avoid conflict of interest, both for subcontracting and purchase of goods, works and services. This also includes durable equipment. You also have to purchase them. What do we usually see when we're in the field doing audits? Well, base value for money is not demonstrated. There are no documents to support it. We cannot see that you check quotes or that you at least query the market. Make sure you keep every document to support that. Uh, you have procurement practices or purchase practices, but for some reason they were not observed. While there should not be difference between your normal activities and an action implementation. Again, no documentation kept, or that there are conflict of interest that uh, override at, or that hinder the competition. So make sure this is addressed at an early stage. Thank you, Angela. 
So, so let's have our another type of, of all the direct costs, which are the, the equipment, the depreciation costs. Um, in this case, I would like to start by the second point of this slide, where it says that only the depreciation incurred in the duration of the period of the action is eligible, not the full cost. So this is something that is very important in most, most of the grant agreements. Only the Horizon 2020, only the depreciation is eligible. It's very rare. It happens there are some grants which are done uh, for, uh, for instance, capacity building, so to allow to buy things, for the beneficiary to uh, get additional capacity, research capacity. But these are a few. So massively, in your grant agreement, only the depreciation is eligible. Check, be careful. There are some specific cases, very particular also with prototypes, but if you have this in your grant agreement, please discuss it with your project officer to be sure about what you can charge. And if this is a case in which exceptionally you may charge the complete uh, cost of the development of the prototype, for instance. Otherwise, bear in mind, it's only the procedure which is eligible. And this is normally the biggest mistake that we find uh, in, ter in terms of, of size and impact in the depreciation cost. That people believe that, okay, I can just buy the thing and I charge the, the, the cost to the, to the grant agreement and that's fine. So I insist, it's not fine. Even if your accounting is cash-based, we see less and less of these cases, but even if your accounting system is cash-based, we do not generically allow for charging the full price. Why that? Because you see that we ask also for the depreciation to be calculated in accordance with international accounting standards, also with the beneficiary usual practices. But I insist if this usual practice is like the cash-based accounting, I charge everything in the year in which I buy the item, this is not compatible with the, the international accounting standards for depreciation and we will uh, make an adjustment in case of an audit or uh, if we identify the unit reporting, we will make a correction. Uh, so this brings us back to what Angela has already explained, that also uh, when you buy the, the piece of equipment, it must be purchased in accordance with Article 1011, which summarizing goes in again in, into this idea of you must buy uh, respecting best value for money and no conflict of interest. I'm very important because this I have, we have also seen uh, rather often when you calculate the depreciation in accordance with international accounting standards, the useful life of the, pro of the item, of the equipment, is not the action duration. There might be cases in which is. There might be reasons why the, the item is only, the life of the item ends with the, with the project, there is no any more use for it. It is possible, but these are, again, rather exceptional and it cannot be the norm, the rule that you apply that systematically so that I can recuperate everything from the grant. I fixed uh, the, the useful life of the item upon which the depreciation is to be calculated equal as the, act as the action, the duration of the action. That's not possible as a, as a rule. Okay, the other way, all right. So a couple of examples just to insist on this idea. Uh, a beneficiary uses an X-ray machine for the action for a few hours and the rest of the time the machine is used for other activities. And the beneficiary charges the full depreciation uh, for the period, for instance, the reporting period uh, in the cost statement of the action. That's not allowed. Even if the original idea, the, 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 the reason why the X-ray machine was purchased was because was, it was necessary for the project, that does not allow you to charge automatically the full uh, price of the machine or the full depreciation, notably if it is used for other activities. So insisting on this point, what is the rule? If the beneficiary, so if you do not use the equipment exclusively for the actions for our Horizon 2020 project, only the portion that is used for the action on the action may be charged. And you need to be sure that if Angela comes to visit you, you have documents proving how much is the time that the machine was used for the, for the action. So in practice, the allocation of the part of the annual depreciation to our project must be calculated using, well, the number of hours, days, months, whatever is the uh, unit of use of the piece of equipment, of actual use of it for their specific action, so for our project. And this actual use 
must be directly measured. Remember what I insisted very much at the beginning of the presentation. Direct cost mean di means direct measurement. So if again, if we are speaking about estimations, we will tell you, sorry, this is not a direct cost. It, it will be covered by the 25% in direct cost. All right? So you need this direct measurement. In the case of, of the use of equipment, you can typically have a lookbook, for instance. There might be other ways to, to prove it. It depends on your side, but notably, but well, I think that from another perspective, the most uh, typical example is the logbook. Another example, and this I insist is also a real life, something that we have encountered in, in more than one occasion. A beneficiary applies two different definitions of useful life. So they have for generically, or in general, they apply five years uh, useful life to calculate depreciation, but when the equipment is uh, purchased uh, to be used in a research grant, they say, well, we depreciate over the, the duration of the grant. Well, this is not acceptable because at, at the end, if you see it uh, on the final outcome of this way of proceeding, what you are doing is to charge the full price of the equipment to the grant just by adjusting the, the uh, useful life of the item to the duration of the project. I insist, I recall, it might be a specification in which this is uh, correct, because I insist the item has no any more use, no any more value, it's exhausted at the end of the project, whatever reason is. Uh, but generically, this is not possible. Uh, it would imply that uh, you discriminate or overcharge or adjust in a way that you circumvent the rules about depreciation just to obtain again the full price or the full uh, cost via depreciation of the piece of equipment. So no, that cannot be done. Over to you. Thanks. Let's talk about, about the certificate and financial statements. It's a typical of their costs. And you need to provide the certificate according to Article 20.4 of the grant agreement. But when do you provide it? If you are requesting a contribution to your action that reaches, uh, that is equal or more than 325,000 euros, then you have to request the certificate, to present the certificate. And, but how you calculate the tre this threshold? It is it consists only those costs that you're declaring as actual costs and those unit costs that you calculate and according to usual accounting practice. By this, we mean those personal costs that you're using for which you're using unit costs according to usual accounting practices and in internally invoiced goods and services. This means that it doesn't include flat rates like indirect costs. Uh, the CFS or the Certificate of Financial Statements have to be provided at the end of the action and is one certificate per beneficiary or third party. It must be submitted by the coordinator 60 days after the end of the last reporting period. He gathers all of the certificates and submits, submits them all at once. What should it cover? The certificate may cover the whole action, so one certificate for all the whole action period, or you can have certificates for each reporting period. When you choose that option, make sure that the price of the individual, the reporting period CFS is equivalent or better than if you had obtained one certificate. And make sure you uh, only ask for a CFS reimbursement if it was above the threshold of 325,000 euros. Then remember to, cost the, uh, to claim the cost of the CFS under the cost for goods or services. This is a type of cost that is, can be incurred after the end of the action. Uh, and it's eligible because we know you can only obtain the certificate once you have incurred all the costs. Then let's have also another reminder on exchange rates. It's also a, a, a topic that we get some questions on. If you have your accounting in euros, then it's very easy. You go and you purchase uh, whatever goods or services you need. Sometimes it has to be in another currency and you record them in your accounts, you use your usual accounting practice. So when it comes to reporting to the European Commission or an agency, you just have to follow that same accounting practice to report them in euros. However, if your accounts are in other currencies, then you probably use your accounting practice to record them in your accounts. But when it comes to reporting to the commission, you have to report them in euros. And for this, you have to use the average of the daily exchange rate published in the official journal of the EU calculated over the reporting period. There is a link available in the, in the grant agreement with, and in, it has editable charts that you can use and make, and it's very easy to, to determine which is the rate you have to apply. What happens when you are reporting adjustments to costs previously reported? Then use the rate applicable in the period when you are making the adjustment. And what happens with the cost that you incurred after the end of the action? Then use the, report, the applicable rate in the last reporting period. 
and here we are coming to the last uh, part of, of this uh, short presentation that I wanted to do this morning uh, as an introduction also to open later on the, the uh, questions and answers part of the session, which I insist I think is the most interesting part for all of us. Um, just I wanted to make a, a short remark because I saw in a slide or some questions about travel costs. There's no problem. Travel costs, we can reply. We haven't made any specific issue or any specific presentation on, on the travel costs because the, the number uh, and the size of errors into travel costs is, is quite limited. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, you uh, do not have questions about it. Uh, feel free. We will, of course, try to reply. It's, it's within the, the, the types of costs that fall into the, uh, the part dedicated to all the direct costs. So uh, I just wanted to explain that we don't have a slice on that, but you may ask questions. And the reason is that this, the, the errors are normally very few and very small. Please keep it like that. <laughs> uh, so. This, this last part of the presentation is perhaps a bit more uh, complex, if you want, particularly for those that are not used to this, um, uh, to the use of third parties, or do they do, do, who do not know that they're using third parties, which is the worst scenario, and it happens also. So let me try to explain you what is a third party, because here the key element is when uh, there is one of the eligibility conditions is that the cost, the cost eligibility conditions is that the cost must be recorded in the accounts. And it means that it must be recorded generically in your account. Uh, unfortunately, this does not always happen. It's very often not intentional, but uh, when it happens, it's a real problem. And this is the context into which we should uh, be knowledgeable, or you should be knowledgeable about what is a uh, third party and how the cost of the third parties can be eligible for you. So the very easy definition, the very simple definition is that uh, a third party is somebody who do not sign the grant agreement. So it has something to do with the grant agreement, but didn't sign, didn't accede to the grant agreement. Okay, that's why it's a third party. It's not the, the EU authority who signs, and it's not the beneficiaries of the grant agreement, it's someone else that has something to do with the grant agreement. And we have three types of third parties. The, third, the first type, it's uh, those third parties who are directly carrying out part of the work that is described in Annex 1. So the research project uh, is not, in this case, completely done by the beneficiaries. Someone else is helping directly with the work. This is the first type of third parties. We will see very quickly the, the, the couple of elements of each. Eh? We will not enter into the whole uh, details, just the key details on which we uh, recurrently find mistakes. The second type of third parties is those who do not do any part of the work, but contribute with uh, resources, goods or services for the beneficiaries doing that part of the, their part of the work. And there's a third type of third parties who we will, we will not treat today unless you have any specific questions because you are aware of you are in a grant in which they, they are used, which is the third, third parties receiving financial support. It's a kind of, of sub-grant. Again, this is uh, rather exceptional, uh, and, and it can only be used when authorized in the, in the call for proposals. So that part, in principle, we are not touching today, even if you see some, some uh, further guidance in one of the slides. The first type of third parties are those who carry out part of the work of, in the action, so part of what is described in Annex 1, part of what is the research uh, project. The subcontractors, um, Angela has already explained it, uh, how it works and what are the conditions. So I will just make a few references about link third parties. First, who can be a link third party? Those are either affiliated entities, so affiliated to one of the beneficiaries, meaning under that or in direct control of the beneficiary, or uh, uh, that uh, the beneficiary, uh, they, are, that they are members of the same group, to put it simple. So you see there the reference of the 50% shares or majority voting rights, et cetera, et cetera, so that they are really uh, affiliated in the standard way in which can be understood. Or these are also, they may also be entities who have a legal link with a beneficiary, meaning something that there is a legal relation that is not specific to the grant agreement, so that, that it precedes and outlasts typically the grant agreement. And what is important about these linked third parties? They are linked to one of the beneficiaries, so they must be identified in the grant agreement. So they are doing part of the work and they must appear under Article 14. 
they can also declare costs as if they were beneficiaries. So you see here when I was saying the cost must be recorded in your accounts. When you have a link third party, in this case, the cost can also be recorded in the accounts of the link third party. But for that, you, you need to have the link third party into the grant agreement under this Article 14. And actually, a, a very special characteristic of these link third parties is that they submit their own financial statements. So you as beneficiary will not declare the cost of your link third party. It's going to be a separate financial statement in which the link third party will include uh, its own costs. So in case, of, in case of an audit, for instance, the auditor can go directly to this link third party and uh, audit the costs that they declare and that we expect to find in their accounts. Uh, very exceptional, that's, that's on, it's not really uh, relevant at this stage because it was when we were still signing uh, Horizon 2020 grant agreements, which does not happen anymore. At that time, we could also request uh, to accept joint and financial liability for the EU contribution. So, lean third parties, you bring them by the hand and you say, this is my lean third party, and you include it into the grant agreement, and they, then they, even if they don't sign the grant agreement, they act as if they would be a beneficiary. We go now to the second part, the second type of, of, uh, of third parties, these other third parties, those who do not do any part of the action directly, but who contribute uh, with resources, for instance, to uh, you as beneficiary carrying out the work. Contracts, as also uh, Angel has already explained, so I want to focus on in-kind contributions. So in-kind contribution is you have someone else that gives you something to, uh, for you to carry out the work in the action. This gives you something, might be, well, not necessarily give you, it can lend you, for instance, the use of a laboratory. Uh, seconded staff is typically one of the cases of in-kind contribution, so it's not your staff, it's somebody, somebody who comes from a different university, for instance, is seconded, uh, and so uh, it might perfectly be that the costs of the person are not going to be in your accounts, they're going to be in the accounts of the other university who hired the person, you see? That's why it's, uh, we're speaking about in-kind contributions. They can be free of charge, so you pay nothing for them, and still, miracle, you can also share costs, or they can be against payment. One key element of this is that uh, you can only declare up to the actual eligible cost of the third party. So, for instance, if you are paying for the second professor, imagine that you pay more than what the other university gives the person as a salary, then we'll say, uh, sorry, you might be paying more, but you can, also, you can only charge up to what the other university is paying to the person, so up to the eligible cost of the third party, which is what we will find in their accounts. Crucial, if you have these cases, you must include them in Annex 1. You must say in Annex 1, I will have this resource of this person who is coming from another university, and, and then I will not go into the, the, the uh, procurement procedure, for instance, because I already know who is coming. I already know from what entity is coming. I already know if I will pay and how much I will pay. You see, so it's not an open contract. You already have uh, something linked with this other entity, which allows this transfer of resources, if you want. If you don't ident identify this in Annex 1, the, uh, the Commission or uh, whoever is the EU granting authority, the joint undertaking, the executive agency, can still approve those costs during the periodic reports, but they can also reject them. So you have no, if you go down that line, you have no assurance that the costs are going to be eligible. And we have seen the case in which we say it's rare, but it happens that we see, well, if, if, if the granting authority will know, would know that so many people from outside will be participating, would not have signed the grant agreement, and then we reject these uh, in-kind contributions. It's rare, but it happens. And in any case, it becomes much more complex if you forgot during the whole implementation of the action to report that you have these in-kind contributions. And if Angel, our colleagues, come later on and find it, we will, we will most likely have to reject those costs. So be very careful not to forget. If you have this type of contributions included in Annex 1, if you did not did it yet, ask for an amendment. And if nothing can be done, do it in the reporting period. Explain clearly what are you receiving how, how much is supposed, how you are supposed to pay for it, etc., etc. 
The examples is what I say, for instance, secondary staff, use equipment, etc. I will not, don't worry, I will not go into the details of this table, but I think it's very useful because there you see all the characteristics in one shot, all the characteristics of the difference of the different third parties. So I think that this is a very good dead memoir, something for you to know very quickly uh, what could be the type of third party that you may have and, and what should you do about it. But we will not get into the details, at least now. The warning, very important. It might look very nice and very easy to say, well, you know what, uh, I have this other entity, we, we get work well uh, together. Rather than going into an open subcontracting, I've got to bring the muscling third parties. Or saying, well, you know, uh, we typically share professors with this uh, other research center and, and uh, rather than hiring any people, we will have these people seconded and, and there's not a problem. We put it in Annex 1 and that's perfect and lovely, very easy. It is. But for me, there is one crucial element that you must bear in mind. If something goes wrong with your third parties, you pay for it. We have no legal relation. We have no legal relation with these third parties. So, if they overcharge it, if they make mistakes, I don't mean even that it's intentional. Uh, there is uh, errors in the declaration, and eventually we realize that there has been eligible costs declared that are actually not eligible. We will have to recover those costs, the EU contribution based on those costs, and we cannot go to your third party because they didn't sign the grant agreement. So we have no legal capacity to claim anything from them. So the only possibility for us, and what is explicitly stated in the grant agreement, is that we will have to go for you. If something needs to be recovered because of failures in the third parties, we will have to recover from you as beneficiaries. So uh, that do not prevent you to use these third parties. Just be careful, uh, pay attention, be sure that you can trust the third party. Uh, there are a couple of requirements there that, that, that uh, you as beneficiary must ensure that we can audit the third party. If, if the third party says we don't open the door to, to Angela, we will simply reject all the costs because we are not able to audit. So for us, it will become not eligible. So you need to be sure that if there is a request for an audit on, on the third party, they will be ready to welcome us to check this, those costs. Uh, also for the European Court of Auditors and, and of course for all of investigations. By the way, if there is an, an audit on our side in a third party, you, will be, you would be informed. And just to wrap up, I think well on time, uh, there is a lot of information available, but, but a, a big improvement uh, with previous framework programs that we had in Horizon 2020 is that all information was uh, gather it together just in a couple of documents. You have the Horizon 2020 annotated grant agreement where all the interpretation of the provisions of the grant agreements, so all the explanations, examples, references are together there. Uh, you have the link and the Horizon 2020 online manual for everything that is much more practical uh, about reporting declarations, etc., etc. If after reading or even before reading, <laughs> you have uh, still questions, you have uh, you may contact your uh, the network of national contact points. These, these are people who are in your country know know your particularities, your accounting systems. I might help you a lot. We are in constant content, contact with them, and you can also address your questions directly to us through the research inquiry service. You have the link there. It might even happen that today during the session on questions and answers. If a question is particularly complex or needs further analysis, we will tell you, well, send the question to the research inquiry service because it will end with people like Angela and me who will provide you a written reply. And Robbie, I think that's all from our side for now and we are ready for the questions and answers. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Angela and David. Uh, for this interesting pr presentation. Uh, and thank you for respecting the timing because I see it is uh, 10.45. We are perfectly on schedule, uh, which means we have now plenty of time. We have 45 minutes uh, until 11.30 to uh, go to m maybe what is even mm -hmm. the more I m interesting part for you, which is uh, answering to your questions. So I will go through the questions in Slido, starting, as I said before, by the most voted, the most popular ones, and then uh, David and Angela uh, can reply to your question. So let's start with the first question. Due to unforeseen reasons, for example, health, 
a partner has to cancel a trip. The cost have been engaged and are not refundable. Is this cost eligible and how do I report it? Well, I think I take this one because it has to be the bad guy, so she can be the gentleman. <laughs> no, I'm afraid that we, well, there might be cases of what we call force majeure, in which the costs are, are still eligible, but health reasons uh, to cancel a trip, I'm afraid it's not one of those. Uh, typically, you can have a policy of, the, the, of cancellation of trips, etc., so it can be, it can be avoided. Uh, and we do not consider this as uh, force majeure. Sorry, that's, that's how the rule applies, and voila, <laughs> bad guy there. Second question. What should someone inscribe in timesheets when, oh, sorry, uh, this is. <laughs> when uh, the 215 days equivalent uh, are exceeded, but still have worked in the action? The person does not report days in timesheets, I well, this, this is first personal cost, <laughs> yes, so it's not it's the for, issue. And, it's and second, it's Horizon Europe. Europe. <laughs> it's not Horizon. Remember what I was telling you at the beginning. It's, it's not that we don't want to replace it. Everyone has its own expertise and we prepare differently the presentations. So, so we, have, we have presentations on, on, on um, Horizon 2020 personal cost, very uh, uh, dedicated, and, um, specific and detailed on, on this issue. And we have presentations, or we will have at least presentations on, on Horizon Europe. I don't want to risk, I could do it, but I don't want to risk getting into all the details of how this is to be uh, treated in Horizon Europe because it will take uh, quite some time and it's not today's subject. I'm really sorry for the 84 persons. I really suggest you first to check the, the already recorded Horizon 2020 presentation on personal costs. And I think we are having soon a Horizon Europe also uh, in which we will treat the personal costs in June, I think. Or soon. Soon. <laughs> yes, they will be, uh, mainly they will be the coordinators day uh, in June where many things will be explained. Uh, it will be the 8th of June, if I remember correctly. Uh, next question is, I'm afraid again, a question <laughs> on, on personnel. Uh, okay, I'm going to still read it. Uh, I think it's quite easy to answer. Him. Okay, but okay, that, we one, can, that one is generic for both. I think implementation can. personnel is different from the staff, so the personnel costs declared, I guess, uh, are different from the staff budgeted for the action. So daily rates and uh, person months uh, don't match with the budget. How do you manage? Um, I think uh, you declare the reality. The, remember, the budget indeed is an estimation. Nobody is expected to know today exactly what is going to happen in three years' time. Nobody expected Ukrainian war, nobody expected inflation, for instance. So, of course, there's going to be differences. Um, if for in, during, during uh, the technical reports, you find or we find that the, the real person months are very different from what was uh, initially expected, well, you will be asked to give an explanation. It doesn't mean that there is a problem in itself. It means that, well, okay, uh, you say that you will do something, uh, you will take, it will take six person months, I took 18, why? And there might be perfectly reasons, say, the, the research is, is, uh, is, is going quicker or slower, or we, have, we found this problem that, that slowed down the, the development or the, the implementation of the research work. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It means that you need to have an explanation. There might be also reasons with which we might not agree. Uh, put you an example: if, if you are said during the um, uh, in your proposal and when you prepare the the honest one, you say, "Well, I will have a, a Nobel Prize doing the research work," and, and the lady is, is so clever that which she will do the work in six months. And then you say, "Well, well you know, eventually the person didn't want to do it, so we." we needed to bring three or four researchers lower level and it takes longer. Well, we might not be so happy with that because this is not what you promised. But, but generically, what only will happen is that you report the reality and if there is divergences with the budget, particularly re regarding technical issues, personal months, we will ask what is the reason. And if it is about money, well, when you reach the, the maximum EU contribution is over, we cannot pay more than that. So th there's no even need for explanation there. Next question. This one is uh, one who is popping up uh, quite often. Are the travel costs to the final review during the 60 days after the end of the project eligible? What happens 
if the review takes place even after the 60 days? I will still take this one, Angela. Then I leave you the others. Okay, so after the end of the project, what is eligible is the cost necessary to prepare the final reports. Uh, so, uh, yes, the final reports normally are to be submitted within the 60 days. If you don't do it, you are late. But it doesn't mean that we will reject them. So the, the, the generic rule, as it is explained in the annotated grant agreement, is that the cost necessary for preparing the final reports can be eligible up, up to the submission of the final reports. And then the review takes place before the submission of the final reports. So don't take the 60 days as the st a strict deadline. The, the really point uh, after which you cannot report any more costs is when you submit these final reports. And we would like to see them in within the 60 days. And you also would like to see them within the 60 days, because the sooner you send the reports, the sooner we pay you the your contribution. But we all know that uh, it often happens that the reports come late. And if it comes late and we accept also this, this uh, cost that might be incurred. And I insist, it's just for the, for the final reports. So it's not about you continue the research. You continue the research. For us, the action is over. We cannot accept any more costs own research, it's just for the preparation of the reports. And this, I insist, may be eligible up to the submission of these final reports. Thank you, David. Next question. Uh, in case of audit, it's again a question on personal cost, but OK, let's uh, answer to this one. Must we have timesheets on paper, or will PDF versions be OK? And for this question, I leave uh, Angela answer. Sure. I'll take care of this one. Well, um, for timesheets, uh, you have to follow your usual practice. You usually have a time recording system. If the time recording system is in paper, those are the, the timesheets we need to see. If the time, sheet record, time recording system is electronic, then for, it, for the timesheets to be accepted, they need to be, they have to have a um, defined username and access rights. So we can see that only the person that worked in the action it can record time, uh, they have to be authorized by the supervisor and they have to, that has to be visible in the system and they has to be auditable, uh, the system has to be auditable. If as a result of this time recording system you have a PDF that uh, and all of the criteria are, is, is met, is, is fully complied with, then we can access the PDF versions once we have assessed that the time recording system complies with all the eligibility criteria. So it really depends on what is the system in place and what are the conditions to fill in each case. Anything else, David? Fine. There you go. Next question. An equipment has been purchased to carry out tasks only for the project, but it is not used 24 hours a day, not even every day. Can we charge the full depreciation? My best guess would be yes, but let's see what uh, Angela or David uh, want to say. I can take care of this one if you want. Um, well, uh, if it's only used for the project, yes, you can use only you can charge the depreciation incurred in the period of the action. Again, if this equipment has a, what is the useful life of this equipment? Is it shorter? Is it the same? Is it longer than the action period? Follow your usual accounting practice and calculate the depreciation as usual. Yet we still have to be able to de uh, demonstrate that this uh, equipment is used only for the action, even if, even if not every day, but if only for the action, you have to be able to demonstrate that's the case. And if that's the case, then the depreciation incurred in that period can be eligible. That's, uh, may, may I go ahead? In what you say is, is, but I want to give uh, a hint. I would like you to reflect on something because we, about what we would like you to do also with this type of course. Um, what Angela said is totally correct. It's, it's how it is. So basically, yes, it's possible. Now, what we would like you also to think is about sound financial management. And I will now give you the example. Let's imagine that, that uh, this summer you want to do a road trip and you don't have a car. And you want to, you, to go one week south of Europe, Spain, my country, for instance, uh, for the sun, you know. And, and what would you do? Would you rent a car for this one week trip or do you buy the car and put it in the garage the rest of the, rest of the year? So when thinking about these research grants, please think the same thing. Uh, public money doesn't rain from heaven. So if you can 
if you have a more economically uh, optimal option, if you can rent the equipment, because it's going to be used just a few times, you can subcontract the use of this equipment, perhaps. See if there is something that you can do about it. See as if it would be your holiday trip, and what would you put into that? So even if, well, I, I can buy this, uh, I don't know, uh, electronic microscope that I'm sure that I will use for the project. I don't think I, don't think I will have anything else to do with it, but okay, it's going to be nice. So it's going to be, I can show my guests that you see the electronic microscope that I have now. Please think if it's really necessary. If you are not, you have, if you will not have an intensive use of it, if it's going to be just an occasional use for the project and then you don't really know what to, what to do about it or what to do with it, see if there is something else that you can do so that more money can be used for other uh, activities in the grant, or if you are so generous also for other research grants in Europe. So the rule is perfectly as you say, but I wanted you to think about this, this other dimension of this, of this issue. Thank you, Robbie. Next question. Due to the COVID-19, estimated travel costs have not been incurred during the project, but on the other hand, personal costs are higher than uh, foreseen, higher than planned. Is this okay to report it? I, I take it. You can take it or... Uh, you tell me when you want to take it. <laughs> See, yes, yes. Uh, in the example that you are giving is a, is a typical, typical thing that has happened in many projects. That's, that's, that's not a problem. It's the real situation. You see the difference between budget and reality. We expected to travel, we couldn't travel, but eventually there has been real personal cost. Eh? No, because I have money liberated release here because I don't travel, I will put some more people like there. No, there were more personal costs because it was necessary for the action. Yes, you can declare the reality of the personal cost and say that you didn't have this travel cost because well, eventually it was not possible or it was, or it was not necessary to do the travels. If ever you have a doubt, because this is a very easy example, uh, we will not get into details, but if you want to have, for instance, new subcontracts, as Angela explained, you need to put it in Annex 1. That is it's not as straightforward. This example is very straightforward. Uh, but in case of doubt, remember that you have also and always the possibility to contact your project officer to check that, okay, this is what I intend to do. Is, is, is there any problem about it? Voila. Next one, uh, regarding travel expenses, are taxis uh, or car rental eligible costs? Uh, who wants to take this one? Look, uh, the direct answer is it depends on what you normally do. So if uh, your travel policy is to pay for taxis, we pay for taxis. If your travel policy is, okay, uh, when going to visit a, a customer, uh, well, if you are going to be there for three days, we allow you to rent a car, the same for us. Whatever you do just for us, we don't, have, we don't accept. Well, unless it's part because of our rules. In some cases, you need to modify some elements, like, like our calculation of direct costs, because it doesn't fit uh, your practice with our rules, or the depreciation uh, that, uh, that we were giving as an example earlier. But for travels, that's also what I was saying before. We see quite few errors into travels because we accept what you normally do. So unless you intentionally do something else to charge the, the grant agreement, if you do as you normally do, we will go along with it. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Next question on equipment. Uh, it is a little bit similar question to the one uh, we answered uh, previously. And equipment is necessary for the project, but it is not used daily. We do not usually keep records on the working time of our machinery. Can we still charge uh, the full cost of uh, the equipment? Angela, David, yes. Angela, please. Well, as we said in the previous questions, where when it comes to equipment, you can only charge the depreciation costs uh, that has been uh, incurred during the action period. So full cost, no depreciation cost. Now, if the equipment is necessary for a project, that's good, but you still have to demonstrate that you only used it for the project. So even if it is not usual for you to keep a record of the working time for the machinery, in this case, you have to be able to to directly measure how much time did you use it to demonstrate that it was only used for the project, for the action. And again, charge only the depreciation cost incurred during the action period, and that corresponds to the time you used the, the, the equipment. But do not forget the 
uh, good uh, rules that uh, David explained, it still has to be sensible in terms of financial management and just use the equipment as uh, reasonably as possible. Thank you, Angela. Uh, the next two questions are again on personal costs, uh, and I guess it will be also uh, for you, Angela, uh, because they are related to timesheets. Uh, does the timesheet need to have an unwritten signature, or is it possible to do this di digitally? Unfortunately, we still have to use a lot of paper. Angela? Again, um, yeah, it depends on your time recording system. If your usual practice is to write a signature by hand, uh, that's acceptable for us. If you're going to use digital signature, make sure it's a, a, an appropriate uh, and accepted e-digital signature. It's not enough to scan uh, a signature and paste it. That's not eligible. If it's an electronic signature, it has to be valid. If it's a handwritten signature, it's, it can also be accepted. And on the same subject, uh, who is to countersign the timesheet? The person who is responsible of the project uh, or the director of the structure of the research works? But this actually, we leave the beneficiaries up to, for them to decide who, who signs the timesheet. It's usually the direct supervisor of the person that signs the, the timesheet. In some cases, they might be assigned to a project and thus a project manager signs the timesheets, which is fine. Or it's, or it's usually the normal hierarchical superior that uh, recognizes the time, that re reviews it and accepts the time. Either way, uh, as long as it's properly, um, there's a control on the timesheets uh, and that, we, that is visible on them, either electronically or uh, in paper, that's okay. Next question. During plenary general assembly meetings, are coffee breaks and social dinner considered special meals? Uh, according to what is written in the annotated grant agreement, page 39. Are they eligible? Maybe this one uh, is for David. We want to do both, both of us, because uh, I was checking. I, I came with my AGA electronic, <laughs> <laughs> and I was checking. And actually, in, in the page 39, it says, are generally not eligible. So I stick to the, <laughs> to the AGA, which says that these uh, social meals are generally not eligible. Um, uh, well, for the, everything uh, depends a bit on what you are putting there. So. Uh, the the social dinner just just the way the word social in the middle we probably will say look uh, f you can do party whatever you want but not with public money it's very nice from you I also would like to participate but uh, it's normally on top each person traveling should share their own cost let's imagine you know in many cases uh, people who is traveling get an allowance for the for the lunch and dinner. So if we pay the dinner for everyone uh, because the coordinator pays and, and we also pay uh, the, for the other ones that person gets, well, that's double charging. We are uh, paying twice the same cost, you see. So, so there is, we have, the, uh, uh, and then you will correct me for, or, or complete from the practical part, eh? but there is this, this uh, typical um, approach that, okay, uh, what, is, what is lunch and dinner, try to put each one on, the, on their own. Then it depends. What other elements are for the coffee breaks? It's part of the organization of, of the meeting and, and we're speaking about, excuse me, about peanuts. Well, I, I don't know what kind of coffee you give, but normally it's peanuts. Mm -hmm. So you, you put it, you don't put it, it would probably get, get through because it's part of, of the evening itself. Um, but the social dinner definitely would be a tricky issue. And then, you know, all depend also on, on what are you putting there. I remember long ago, uh, we had a question saying, can I invite in the dinner to a glass of wine? It was the coordinator asking. Well, first thing will be, well, do you normally invite to a glass of wine in your dinners? And secondly, well, if, even if you do, well, it's not the same if you Le Van de la Maison, uh, if you pay a Chateau and Sepacua uh, at 2,000 euros the bottle, then in the second case, absolutely, we're going to say no. You see, so uh, for the lunch and dinners, uh, really try that, that each person goes with their own cost, you know, these, these invitations. And certainly, the word social there, uh, well, that's, this is not a, a social event. You see, this is a research project. We might be justifiable that, okay, we were the sandwich lunch and we pay for it, the coordinator pay for it. Okay, I don't think the auditors will have a big issue with that. 
but social dinner is going to be much more complex. Could you complete? Indeed, indeed. Uh, especially because social dinners, if, if it implies, um, uh, well, of course, there are a bit above uh, what we usually expect on a, on, a, on a meeting, then we think that maybe the, the, to the costs are not reasonable and those that are not eligible. Uh, as David explained, it really depends on the circumstances, coffee breaks and a sandwich lunch, part of the, part of the assembly, a uh, social dinner, it's something that is, uh, is not to be paid with public money indeed. If I may, because now I was recalling a case of a, of a project where I, at the end, they made a closing kind of party that they charged to the grant. And I remember that at the end, they put all the pictures of the party with the champagne bottles and uh, in, the, in the website of the project. Well, we cannot, uh, this is public money, it's your money. Uh, we cannot accept that. Yeah. It's very fine from you. I also might feel generous and then we have a glass together and we pay for it, but not with public money. You have to remember the costs have to be necessary for the action. Voilà. So was that bottle of champagne necessary for the action implementation? So, uh, please avoid champagne. This is what I remember <laughs> for this, uh, this question. Um, next question. Do you need to show best value for money regardless of the amount uh, or is it sufficient, if it is the common practice of the beneficiary, to have three offers only from uh, 1,000 euro and above? Yeah, I can take that one. Mm -hmm. uh, again, if it's your common practice, if you common purchase procedures foresee that below 1,000 euros you would direct purchase and that above you request a quote, then yes, go ahead and do it. As long as it's documented that that's your practice. I mean, I don't have to see a procurement procedure uh, where it simply is written, that is always written that, that would be ideal. But if you, if you don't have it, I sh you should be able to still demonstrate that for any other purchase, you follow the same procedure. Next question. Can I transfer budget between the direct costs uh, categories without calling the project officer or without the need for an amendment. Maybe I can uh, try to answer that one directly. Right. Uh, usually uh, what does not require an amendment is shift in budget. What does require an amendment is if the tasks are shifted. Uh, so um, I don't see any problem normally in uh, having a shift in budget uh, between categories, if you want to compliment David. Or oh, the, the subcontracting is always, uh, even, I always li like to recall, if you are getting into new subcontracts, then, then you need to go for an amendment. Then you need to contact the PO, say, this is what we need now, we need a new subcontracting, we want to do an amendment, or perhaps the PO says, okay, do, don't do an amendment, but, but explain it clearly in the, in the uh, technical report, which is the, the simplified approval, as we call it. Um, but there you need, and the other case in which you need to discuss with the PO is indeed the budget uh, transfer goes linked to a task transfer. So something that I expected to do myself in the next one it was supposed to be me doing that part of the work. And then I say, well, for whatever reason, it's not going to be any more me. It's going to be uh, Angela now she needs a, a piece of equipment that she doesn't have. And then, okay, the transfer goes fine, but we're also moving tasks, and then probably we need an amendment. For all the rest, indeed, is we, the grant is extremely flexible with the budget. Eh? Not as flexible as Lamson's, but it's still extremely flexible. Thank you, David. Uh, next question. Uh, are coffee break, lunch, dinner costs, and promotional material, uh, for example, gadgets, Related to project meeting and conference, is those costs uh, considered as eligible costs? When I can, I can David or Angela? Yeah. Well, um, David already explained the part on break lunch dinner costs. I think we can, we can probably skip that part. When it comes to promotional material, I guess you're meaning dissemination costs. Dissemination costs are eligible as other direct costs. Uh, if you go to a conference to promote the action, Yes, you can uh, claim the cost of, that, of participating in that conference. If you're going to distribute material about the action, uh, gadgets or any information material, those are eligible as other direct costs. Remember, if you had to purchase them for a third party, it means you best value for money and no conflict of interest. Anything else? That's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. To calculate the eligible hotel subsistent costs, we use a file that was published in, on the 12th of January 2021. Is there an update since the inflation has been high those last years? I, I wonder if this is the unit, the unit cost of the central, uh, because yeah. we don't have a file published, because we go with your usual practices. 
I think they refer to the INTPA uh, per diems. Sometimes I remember some beneficiaries use those as reference, but there's no no way in the grant agreement an obligation to refer to them. We use the usual travel uh, practices of the of the beneficiary. So uh, uh, in itself, Horizon 2020 has no document, as far as we know, <laughs> has no document published either in January or another month saying what is the, the eligible hotel and subsistence. Uh, we go along, as, as we were saying, with the uh, usual travel practices of beneficiaries. I wonder if in some cases somebody may, uh, may have been referred indeed to uh, EU references that we have for ourselves or for, or for um, cooperation projects, but uh, frankly, I don't see it uh, as a reference for Horizon 2020. Do as you normally do. Next question, uh, again on uh, traveling cost. Is traveling to or from the airport uh, for project meetings abroad considered as a, as a travel cost or subsistence cost for reporting purposes? I can take the yes, please. Okay, well, well, travel costs and subsistence costs are reported in the same cost category, so it really doesn't make a difference what you think about it, as long as you follow your own practice. I mean, you reimburse the travel costs, meaning the, the flight tickets and um, yeah, maybe some movement between the office or the house to the airport and then from the airport to the location. If you consider a travel cost, fine. If you consider a subsistence cost, fine. As long as it's your practice and they're reporting the same category, so for us it doesn't make a difference. Next question. In case uh, an audit certificate is not necessary uh, because the budget uh, claimed is under 325,000 euro, what documentation do we need to submit instead? I think I can also take that one. Uh, nothing. I mean, there is nothing which is replacing the certificate on financial statement. You will need to provide, of course, uh, the reports which are uh, necessary according to the grant agreement, your financial statement, technical report. But if no certificate of financial statement is uh, necessary, there is nothing to replace it. Uh, I don't know if you want to complement on this one. Uh, just, just don't throw away the documents. She might come and ask for all the, all the papers and they ask for a pile of things. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but at the time of normal reporting, you, report, you submit your financial statement and that's it. You, there's, as Robbie said perfectly, there, there's nothing replacing the certificate at the time of reporting. Next question. Can budget items be transferred between each other? For example, uh, can the surplus from personal costs be used in the equipment purchasing budget? I would say for that one that, again, uh, shift in budget is, uh, is allowed, of course. Uh, as uh, David said uh, several times, there is a lot of flexibility in terms of budget shift. But of course, uh, it is not a reason because you have less, uh, you, have, you spend less on one category to suddenly say, oh, I will charge more personal costs. No, if the personal costs uh, that are related to this project are higher for a justified reason, then of course you can claim them, uh, but not just inflate them because you spent less in another uh, cost category. I don't know if you want to complement no, for the anecdote, I remember a case in which the beneficiary, what they did is when, whenever they had a project and, and uh, some remaining budget uh, stayed there at the, close to the end of the project, they just distributed this money between the researchers. And I say, well, we had money, we had a budget. No, no, it's, it doesn't go that way. You didn't have budget. Hey, did you use it or you didn't use it? If you didn't use it, the, the, the money remains there. We will use it for another project. So it's not, it's not a gift the moment that is signed in the grant agreement. It needs to be supported by, by real, actual, incorrect costs. Perfect. Thank you, David. And uh, next one. Is a flight uh, cost ineligible if the boarding pass are missing? That's an audit one, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, boarding pass is the easiest way to demonstrate that you actually took the flight. We accept both paper boarding passes or electronic boarding passes, it doesn't matter. What happens if they're missing? Okay, it makes it a bit trickier. If you can't demonstrate that person indeed moved, because we can see that maybe in the morning he took a taxi from, let's say, Brussels uh, center to the airport, and then in the afternoon I see that he took a, uh, a taxi from the airport of Madrid to the location of the site, I can see that he traveled, or he or she. So there's evidence around that shows me that the person made the, 
the, the movement. If you have the board's boarding pass, it's even better. But we can always look at, uh, at the other evidence you have to assess the legibility of the cost. Thank you, Angel. Angela, where can we find the per diem rates per country for Horizon 2020 projects? Uh, <laughs> I think uh, we also mentioned earlier, there is not such a list of per diem for Horizon 2020. Uh, you set your own uh, practices when it comes to travel cost reimbursement, and as long as it's your usual practice, we accept it. And the next question, is a laptop an eligible cost for the project coordination team? Can it be declared totally or under depreciation rates? Uh, I don't know, David or Angela, who wants to take that I will, one? I would like to do a hint, because for me it's like if you ask me, is a chair, can I, cha I cannot charge a chair? Because up to here, I have no chair. I work just standing up all the day. And nowadays, I cannot imagine how can you work with a laptop. So why you will need another laptop for the coordination team? And if you need it, we will most likely tell you, well, for that specific task, this is an indirect cost. Because it's something like the church, like the table. Like, you see, we need it for, ev for everything that we do. The Differently, maybe, if you need a, a specific computer for a project because yeah, it's a super performing computer and you don't have it or, 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 or you need to buy it or, or uh, because the, the requirements of the project are so specific that it's necessary. But a standard laptop, well, you still work like me with paper and pencil. <laughs> so normally, normally, as a generic answer, well, for us, that's, that's not eligible. It's part of the indirect cost. When we are speaking about a standard laptop, and even more when you tell me, well, it's, you know, it's for the coordination, so the administrative part of the work. I don't know why, if you... Indeed, I don't think the action should be used as an opportunity to renew your uh, assets. If I'm sure the project coordination team but existed before the action and will exist after the action, so there's no reason why they have to have new laptops just for the action. You have to ask the question, is this really necessary for the action? If it's a supercomputer that's necessary for the action, indeed it's, uh, it's probably for synovir in the budget and you can claim the depreciation of the cost. But if it's a normal computer, you can, uh, why is it necessary? If it's not already there. Perfect, yeah. Next question, is dinner after a meeting considered an eligible cost? And uh, maybe... Uh, I think here we are, we are talking about here. dinner without champagne. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for me, the, the, it resumes to the same. Um, sorry, it's summarizing the same point. Eh? Uh, it's always tricky for us when there is uh, uh, the cost paid by the. Co I have seen somewhere about uh, experts. I don't know if we will reach that point. That's different. Experts are completely external to the project. You see, but when we are paying, when the coordinator pays for the cost of the other beneficiaries, well, each beneficiary is supposed to declare its own cost. Here, including the subsistence during a travel. So for us, it's always complex. Uh, preferably, don't do it. And if you do it, really keep the documentation and, and be sure that it remains reasonable and justifiable. And, and still, you may have, uh, sorry, Angela, but still you may have tricky auditors that go into the point saying, well, how can you prove that nobody has declared this cost? And that can be extremely complex. So I know it's, 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 it's rather unpolite to say to every now you pay your own share, OK. But you may set, I don't know, internally in the consortium agreement a, a small part for these for this, uh, expenses if you want, so you don't declare it as, as eligible, because there might be other options. We cannot tell you uh, straightforward, yes, don't worry, you go ahead, because I insist the risk of, of double charging exists, because most of the people attending there from the other beneficiaries will also declare into their travel costs the, the dinner somehow. So I'm fine. If, if possible, try to avoid it. And, and, and as I say, certainly you pay for the champagne and we go there and take it with you. Thank you, David. Next question. Uh, can a beneficiary pay conference fees for speakers from its travel budget? Interesting one. Who wants to take it? Maybe I can start and maybe yes. you can help me. <laughs> I can try. Uh, well, <laughs> begin with conference fees are not travel costs. I think we talk about conference fees, we, also, we should look at them under the, uh, other goods and services. And it's usually for beneficiaries to participate in conferences and disseminate the results of the action. Here, if you're invited speaker, inviting speakers to a, for a conference, um, 
there would usually be speakers from another beneficiary or I'm not really sure how could we could just use it there. I may be like experts in which you may uh, pay travel and, and in some cases even justify the, the if you pay them a fee, but then you need to have it also in the Annex 1 saying that you will have experts coming to participate. So, and in case of doubt, always contact the project officer because these are generic answers. Like the things can vary a lot uh, between a project to the other. And I was, of course, kidding with my example of the 12 bottles of tequila, but there have been very bizarre things that are used in projects that you normally don't expect them to be there and actually were necessary because of the specificity of that project. So, so if, if you need, a, I don't know whom, come in to speak and you have to pay it, uh, because it's a, the uh, best world level expert on the field. Okay, that, that should be perfectly fine. Just check with the project officer if you need to put it somehow, somewhere, or at least that, that uh, uh, the project officer is, is informed and can support you at the time of reporting the costs. Generically, the experts need to be in Annex 1. That's, that's the formal part of the, the, the reply. Next question, still on uh, travel uh, cost. Are travel agency fees considered eligible, given that the procedure is in compliance, uh, of course, with beneficiary usual account accounting practices? Maybe Angela on that one? I think that the answer is yes, as long as it's again usual accounting practice and there are supporting documents proving they record the costs, I think they are, they are still eligible. Thank you. Uh, next one. As best value for money to be applied also for travels, do we need to keep records of hotel, plane prices under the period of interest? I guess the answer will be yes, but uh, I'll leave uh, my colleague auditor answer to that one. Uh, sure. I guess when you usually travel and you pay your own budget, you always look for the best flight in terms of the cheapest one and a hotel that is reasonable, if not the cheapest. We don't pay for first class uh, flights. Uh, I think that's uh, non-reasonable and not necessary for the action. And uh, when it comes to hotels, what is the usual practice? Do you usually you have a ceiling for how much you pay in a, for a hotel? That should be applied also for EU actions, the same as you, you, you do it for other actions. And uh, well, best value for money is something you should always have in mind when, when using your own money, so as well for, for public money. Think. Thank you. Uh, next question. Is the CFS mandatory if the beneficiary has budgeted in the grant agreement more than uh, 325,000 euro, but the actual recorded costs are less than this threshold? Well, in this case, uh, no. If the actually uh, declared costs are Below the threshold, you do not need uh, to submit a CFS. And I think this is quite straightforward. Um, next question. Um, can you please share the link to the webinar mentioned uh, on there personal is one cost? That up. There is one question that jumped it up. Ah, now. sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so now, we, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And the CFS, is the CFS mandatory if the beneficiary has budgeted? Okay, this we said already. The next one is the purchase of or lease of software licenses must be reported as other cost or equipment. This one, who wants to take it? No no, normally it's purchase of services, eh, but, but uh, it doesn't really, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't really matter <laughs> because uh, the, the, um, there is no different funding rates for them and, and basically the, the provisions that apply are the same because if you would put it under cost of equipment, which is not equipment because it's not physical, but if you, even if you put it under cost of equipment, it would be subject to the liability conditions of Article 1011 so of, of purchases. So, uh, well, for me, it would be other costs, but if you put it under equipment, we, in case of an audit, they will simply reclassify into the other categories. So, you do not need to be worried about that, about that specific, about what, where to put it. Yeah. Next question, uh, can you please share the link uh, to the webinars mentioned on personal cost? Well, so 
for those webinars uh, on avoiding error on personal costs, uh, there have been, I think, at least 12 sessions of them. You can uh, find uh, the link to these webinars on the Funding and Tender uh, portal. You go under Events and you will see uh, all those uh, webinars. You can see the re registration and, uh, and the question and answer sessions that uh, have been done to, to these webinars. So go on the Funding and Tender portal, Events, you find all the webinars uh, there. Next question, how to calculate staff cost if the person in question works in part-time and the yearly hours is significantly less than 1,720 hours. So again, it's personal costs. See, this one we don't take because it will take long to reply. You are t tackling several issues there, so it's not a straightforward and, uh, and it's really only personal costs. So that, that really, I promise, because it was me explaining, <laughs> just explain it in the, in the webinar that on personal costs. And if you don't like me, there is another colleague also in another of the sessions, so no problem. <laughs> it's explained it there. Thank you, David. Next one. Uh, does best value for money uh, force bad choice? Can I pick high-priced company with better reputation? Can I take that? Um, well, I don't think it forces bad choice. It really depends on your selection criteria. You as the beneficiary, you know what you need in terms of quality, in terms of uh, the time that it has to be delivered, whatever you're purchasing, and what you're looking for. So when you prepare your technical specifications and know what you want to purchase, then you select those uh, suppliers that meet that criteria, and then you assess the financial ability, viability. So it's up to you to decide what is the balance and price, price quality you want to give, and at the same time ensure you don't pay simply for the name of the supplier, but you actually pay for the quality of what you're purchasing and for uh, with a, paying a good price and not the highest price just because. But you can justify paying a higher price if that's the quality that you had to pay for the quality. You can keep the, keep the supported documents, document all your decisions from the moment you decided on what is the selection criteria, what is the technical specifications look, what you're looking for and the award decision and how you came to that decision. Thank you, Angela. Next one, a uh, meeting abroad is finished at uh, 2 p.m. Can we reimburse the attendance for a full day? And maybe, I don't know. Who oh, wait, wait, for, for me, it's insisting on the same issue of your usual practices. If, if, this, if you normally consider that, okay, the person is abroad, so whatever number of hours is working, I will pay the full day, or I will consider the full day, it's also fine for us. So it's, I insist with really with... Uh, the, the issue of, of travel and subsistence because we, we really follow the practices of the beneficiary. It would have to be something really outrageous uh, for us that we can say, well, this is not some financial management and uh, for us to reject. Otherwise, we go along with your practices. If you normally say it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, we consider that the, because, for instance, the person is abroad, well, even if it finishes at two in the afternoon, we pay the full day or we consider the person working a full day, for us it's also fine. Next one, uh, how long after the end of the project uh, can uh, we yes. audit it? Uh, Angela? I think it's uh, after two years after the final payment has been made. Yeah. This is what I had in mind as well. It was, it was five years, if I remember Ah, that correctly. was, uh, that was the FP7. See, 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 we, we hurry up as much as we can with the Audi, don't worry. <laughs> okay, uh, next one, again for personnel. Can I subcontract personnel? Um, I'll give you answer to this one. It's a tricky one. Eh? It's a bit strange as, as a question. I presume that it refers if we, you can hire people persons through a temporary work agency because to contract personal <laughs> well so so if the question is about temporary work agencies yes that's not a problem it's, a, it's, a, it's as any other purchase of services you are purchasing the service that is the person coming to work for you and your and the, your instructions there you will have to follow also the the cost eligibility conditions of 1011 so of, of purchases notably best value for money no conflict of interest 
Uh, if by subcontract personnel you mean something else? Uh, like a consultant? Like a consultant. Uh, if that consultant is going to be performing action tasks, and for some reason you don't want to enter in an employment relationship, I, you, I think you can subcontract them. Again, if they are performing action tasks, and it has to be foreseen in Annex 1, and you still have to insure base value for money, so you have to demonstrate that that was the, the only supplier available to do the, uh, or the, the, the expert available to do the action task you're, you're going to subcontract. And uh, there was ensure also that there is no conflict of interest. For me, it's complete. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question. What is the policy of salary increases for the personnel during a project over several years? Again, uh, here we are uh, talking about personnel uh, cost. Uh, I don't know if we want to answer to that one or... Uh... Uh, it's, a, it's a funny question because what is your policy? We don't have policy <laughs> about that. So it depends on what you do. Um, uh, we might have problems if we are the, the only uh, farm provider and then uh, we see, and it has happened once or twice, that okay, from one year to the other they, they increase substantially the salaries and you realize about ah, this this entity just basically works for you actions so so they are potentially abusing the system because there is no internal policies that they don't apply this to anyone else but if, uh, for the vast majority of you well it's your policy about salaries is so what you can negotiate with your staff we don't have uh neither up or down how you can uh, change these salaries or or increase or decrease as it was in back in 2012 or something like that eh? So we don't have a rule on that. It's in accordance to, with your practices. Uh, I see it is already 11.33. Uh, maybe we're going to take uh, another couple of questions and uh, then we will end the session. So uh, next question is from Daniela. If an equipment is a part of a prototype, can it be reimbursed for its full cost or is only the depreciation always recognized. Uh, for this one, I don't know who wants to... It can it be. Is, uh, I think you mentioned something, David, uh, on prototypes. Uh, we have a specific... I was looking for the rule, um, but okay, it will take me a while, so... Um, so maybe we can... No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Okay. Uh, there, there are, in the annotated grant agreement, we, ha we have a specific explanation for prototypes, so... so uh, really my advice there and and this uh, t take it really uh strictly to the letter if you have a prototype into your grant agreement if, they, if part of the grant agreement is to develop a prototype uh, get something in writing from the project officers discuss with the project officer in writing that okay is, is this cost or this cost can be considered included on the cost of the prototype can i charge it in full because now i can tell you well yeah uh, if, if there is no other purpose for for the for this piece of equipment uh, the, i don't know one one is taking for instance even the computer which is within the prototype and then at the end there is no use for it because it's going to be destroyed with the prototype well normally yes it's going to be a, it's going to be an eligible cost but we don't know the details of the specific project and we don't know if what you call a prototype is described as such in annex one considered as such and we don't know either your accounting treatment of the element because if you tell us look yes uh, can i choose the full price because it goes into the prototype i would say okay it's part of the prototype fine but then we go in an audit and we see that you have uh, this uh, equipment in your, uh, as part of your assets, in your balance sheet, and you depreciate every year. So both things that do not fit. If you charge me 100% because it's going to be destroyed, there is no reason why you should depreciate over several years, you see. So uh, it's a very tricky uh, issue, the one of, about prototypes that needs to be analyzed case by case. So on the one side, if you are in this situation, discuss keep written trace of what you discuss and potentially agree or confirm with the project officer and be sure that what, whatever you do with the grant agreement then for cost reporting I mean then fits with your accounting records because I insist one of the key crucial cost eligibility conditions is that it must be recorded in the accounts so we must find both things equal. And so we go to the last question and I think it's a pretty good uh, question for last one. Uh, uh, no, now it just changed. Uh, so, 
we have been audited. Uh, process lasted over two years. We spent over 500 hours on the audit, plus costs from our own auditor. Can we claim those costs? Um, I'm afraid you cannot, but I will leave uh, my colleague Angela reply to you. And, uh, indeed, project uh, costs we have incurred for attending the audit are not eligible. I think they're a part of your obligations when you sign the grant agreement, you sign up for the audit, for the potential audit. Thank you, Angela. And so the very last one, would you be able to share with us both the presentation and the replies from the Q&A? Uh, as I said before, uh, all the events, uh, all those webinars that we are having, that we are organizing, are on the Funding and Tender portal under the uh, events uh, page. So, of course, as all the other ones, this presentation and the recording will be available to all of you and you will also see the question and answer session. And it is 11.37, so uh, I'm afraid we have to stop here, but we managed to reply to, I think, many uh, of your questions. I would like to thank uh, very much David and uh, Angela for their interesting presentation and for uh, their uh, answers to all your questions. And I really hope uh, you found this webinar uh, useful and uh, that it will help you really to declare all your costs without making any mistakes. So thank you very much. Uh, having, uh, have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.